So a friend and colleague of mine named Jody Lorimer has a wonderful book called Dancing at the Edge of Death, The Origins of the Labyrinth in the Paleolithic, and uh, I think it's worth looking at this book. She takes a look at this uh, enduring concept of the labyrinth not so much as a physical structure, but as a symbol, and a symbol for what? Well, we, we find when we look at labyrinths in different cultures and different mythologies a uh, something with a cultural focus, a central focus that goes back really over 30,000 years into uh, Neolithic and Paleolithic shamanism and all the way up into the modern religions and uh, probably most celebrated in Greek religion. At the center of this labyrinth in the Greek tradition is a minotaur, is this, uh, is this beast that awaits um, to confront and possibly destroy all who come across its path. But in the earlier traditions, there was actually a goddess at the center of a labyrinth that people worshipped. So what is it about this symbol that has uh, both a god and a monster at the center of it? As a world religions and world literature teacher, uh, one of the texts that we go over on a regular basis is the Babylonian and Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh. And this is a question that's asked in this text as well. Uh, it has to do with the nature of man and the emergence of our own consciousness. How did we become we and uh, the particular things that make us human? And at least in a mythological sense, humans um, are unique because they are sort of part animal, part God. And so what it is to be human is to sort of be part divine and part minotaur. And so when we confront each of those aspects at the center of this labyrinth, we are confronting various aspects of our self, of our own psychology, of our own essence. So why exactly am I talking about this at the beginning of the program, other than the fact that I find it uh, terribly interesting? Well, our guests for this week are Brian and Wendy Froud. Brian is perhaps the most celebrated fairy artist of the past 40 years. Most of you are probably familiar with his work, especially his books on fairies and ghouls and goblins. His wife, Wendy Froud, is considered and called the mother of Yoda. She helped fabricate that puppet for The Empire Strikes Back and also helped work the puppet with Frank Oz. Brian and Wendy were also creative consultants for the movies The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. They are delightful people. We have a wonderful time chatting with them. And it's a lighter conversation, but we get into some heavy stuff. We talk about Jim Henson and the kind of visionary he was, the humanitarian he was. We talk about George Lucas and what it was like to work with him. And they told me some stories off air that were um, that were amazing. And the, the difference between the two, how Hollywood, um, as it seeks to commodify culture and create a commodity culture, we talked a bit about this with Lydia Yuknovich a couple of weeks ago, um, really stamps out creativity in people, especially young artists, and is really in many ways the antithesis of something that would support creativity and transformation in the arts. And to work in that for so long and do things that are still valuable, especially for young people, I, I think is something to, to celebrate. Brian and Wendy's work exists on, or focuses on, I should say, things that can't be focused on. Those things that exist at the edges, at the periphery, the things that we can only see clearly through the corners of our eyes. When we talk about fairies or ghouls, or goblins, we're talking about these things that quote-unquote exist at the sort of edge between waking and dream consciousness, between the known world, the civilized world, and, uh, and the edge of wildness. One final shout-out before we begin the program, folks. The song in the middle of the program is courtesy of Rob Brezhny of Free Will Astrology fame. Rob sent us a song called The Beauty and Truth Lab, that I think you're going to really enjoy. It's kind of shades of Zappa, shades of Rob. Rob's a really creative dude, and we're glad to have his participation in the program. Um, which reminds me, send your stuff in. If we can, we'll get it in on the show. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. As always, look us up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Click into the episode pages on www.ontheblockradio.com and leave us some comments there. Email us and be in touch with what you think about the show episodes you'd like to see, guest recommendations, music, and all of the above. As I say all the time, this is a community endeavor. We're a team here that's working diligently to try to put a show together that you all enjoy. And so far, we're having a blast doing it, learning as we go, uh, with the listener always as the focus. 
So we're glad you're with us, folks. Enjoy this episode, and we'll talk to you on the other side. Welcome to On the Block with Andrew Gurevich, a podcast about authentic people doing beautiful things. Enjoy the show. Folks, uh, this is your host Andy Gervich. We're glad you could be with us, brothers and sisters, and everyone in between. Um, very excited to have the guests we have with us today, Brian and Wendy Froud. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. It is good to be here. For the uh, for the couple of our guests that might not know you by name, let me just read a brief bio for each of you as well, and then we can get some thoughts from you on that afterwards. I always love this section when you have to sit back and listen to your accomplishments read to you like it's an obituary. So, <laughs> Is this going to be like a um, drowning where you see your life flash before yeah, you? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's all very impressive when you condense it together. <laughs> For over 35 years, Brian Froud has been regarded as the preeminent fairy artist in the world and as an authority on fairies and fairy lore. His international best-selling book, Fairies, with fantasy author and or fantasy and Tolkien illustrator Alan Lee, is considered a modern classic. His landmark work with Jim Henson as a conceptual designer on feature films The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, and other Henson projects set new standards for design, puppeteering, and animatronics in film and are considered landmarks in the evolution of modern-day special effects and have attracted an international cult following. With over 8 million books sold to date, his work has been featured in exhibitions throughout the world, and his paintings reside in many private and public collections. Wendy Froud has been a doll maker since the age of five. As soon as she could bend a pipe cleaner and tape bits of fabric together, I can't, can't wait to ask you about that. <laughs> she began to make the kind of dolls she couldn't buy. Dolls of centaurs and satyrs, unicorns and fairies, all to populate her childhood world. She continues to do so to this day. Wendy worked as a sculptor and puppet builder for Jim Henson for many years, primarily on the films The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, and on The Empire Strikes Back. She sculpted Jen and Kira for The Dark Crystal and fabricated Yoda for The Empire Strikes Back. Um, just to pause, so many of my friends were blown away that I was going to be speaking with, as they say, the Yoda maker today, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> um, back to you. Um, Empire Strikes Back. Other work for Jim Henson included The Muppet Show and The Muppet Movie. In addition to her film projects, Wendy has also made puppets for use in television commercials. Her dolls and figures are highly sought after and are in many prestigious collections around the world. She now devotes most of her time to making dolls and figures for exhibition and sale throughout the United States and England. Brian and Wendy Froud, welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. So I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about um, the work that you do, and I want to start, let's start with you, Wendy. Uh, it says in your bio that you've been making dolls since the age of five. Uh, what, I mean, so you've really always been a creative person. I have always been a creative person, and I think it's mostly because my parents uh, were both artists. My father was a sculptor and my mother a painter, so I didn't really have a choice. It was always right there. Mm -hmm. And so they encouraged your art making. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, they would have been happy for me to do whatever, you know, pleased me, but that is what I what I wanted to do. And so, I mean, did you, at what point did you know that this was beyond, you know, something that you just did as a hobby or as a child, and did it become something more serious for you? I think I was always quite serious about it. I know, for, you know, for, mm -hmm. a, for a while I wanted to be an archaeologist mm -hmm. or, uh, I don't know, some other things, but, but I always, always came back to art, and I always came back to creating figures three-dimensional pieces and uh, things that were related to myth, mythology. I was very interested in all sorts of world mythology. As a child, my mother and father both encouraged that a lot. And fantasy. And so the figures you made always were kind of these figures from, from other realms? Yeah. Yeah, they were. Or other time periods. It just it, it, Things that I couldn't buy or couldn't, couldn't find easily, I, I needed to make. You I, needed to make. I did. Yeah. It was, it's always been a vocation. Really? Yeah. 
Did you go to school for it? I did. Since my parents both taught, my father was actually the director of the art school that I ended up going to. Um, yes, I, I have a, a degree in, in uh, art. And so then when you got out of school, did you start, you know, tell us about how you started working. How did as soon as I got out of school, I moved with a whole group of friends to New York. Mm -hmm. And like everybody else, I was you know, planning on being a waitress. <laughs> but um, I had a little exhibition of just a few dolls and puppets that I'd made uh, in the loft that I was living in. And Jim Henson's um, art director came and bought a piece for Jim for mm. a Christmas present. And I got a phone call asking if I wanted to work on a new project. So I've never really done anything else. Wow. It was amazing. Oh, that's unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And uh, Brian, over to you. I read somewhere that Jim had had a fascination with you for several years before you actually started working with him, right? He had a, he had seen some artwork of yours or somebody had given him a piece. A yes, we, kind of we, we believe so. Um, I had, I was a jobbing illustrator mm -hmm. and I, for about five years, I worked in London and did anything that came along. I did book covers and magazine covers and illustrated insides of books. But I was um, getting bored with that and I needed, I felt, to do my own work. Now, what that meant, I didn't know exactly. Mm -hmm. So I moved to the country and immediately um, I was painting pictures of uh, trolls and fairies. And um, the first picture I ever painted, uh, where, I, where I still live, was of a troll with a waterfall coming off the end of its nose. Mm. And that went on to a cover of a book about English illustration. And that's the one that Jim saw. Um, and then I just uh, and I carried on doing more and more books with my illustrations in. And I was one of the first um, people um, that there was a series of books that were coming out of the, the time of all the great illustrators like Rackham and Julak. Um, and I was one of the first people alive that they included in a book like that. So for years, people assumed I was dead. <laughs> um, you love Sir Paul. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I was working, yeah, exactly, yes. I, yeah, I walked around without my shoes on for a long, long time, crossing <laughs> zebra crossings. Um, and so um, it was so that my work was getting out there. And Jim, um, seeing that, really thought it'd be, it would align with his vision of a, he was going to make a, a large-scale movie with puppets in. So he contacted me, and I went to see him. But he, um, other people came to my house and were amazed to find that, uh, that I was also making things. Mm. They made objects and puppets and figures. And um, so I did more than Jim imagined I could do. And indeed, uh, when he came to visit, um, he loved the landscape I lived in. So I live in a landscape that has gnarled trees and rocks and streams and moss, um, and, and which there is a, a lot of mythology. Um, and Jim loved that and said, I want that feeling to turn up in the, in the movie. Hmm. Um, talk to me a little more about that, uh, this, this landscape. Uh, you know, the, the work that I do centers a lot around, um, you know, some of the work Joseph Campbell did and other uh, students of mythology. And Campbell talked about a, a notion that's an Icelandic notion that also he tied to Native Americans of this concept called land naming or land claiming. And it's where people um, seize upon a section of the landscape and mythologize it. Um, or it can work in reverse, that the mythology emerges from the landscape. But it's a necessary connection between a culture and the landscape and this kind of symbiosis that occurs where the people speak to the landscape, the landscape speaks back, and this kind of ancient dialogue emerges where these archetypes come fully formed into the consciousness, and it's very much tied to the land. And when it, it reminds me of this when I hear you talking about that. Well, the landscape, it's, uh, it's in a national park, and um, it's 360 square miles of uh, wilderness, 
basically. It's been inhabited. Uh, it's been ha inhabited in medieval times where there was a lot of uh, mining, mm -hmm. tin mining. And b but prior to that, we've got a, a Neolithic landscape. Yeah. It's, it's littered with stone rows and stone circles and ancient man's evidences really on the surface. And that's what it seems that's really happening in the landscape, that everything's on the surface. It's, it's history and it's stories um, are, are just right there. You don't have to um, search for it. it. It's a landscape that speaks to to us, um, and it has its own mythologies. And so, w when I first encountered it as an artist, when I'm looking at it, I can see the rocks and I can see the trees, and I know what it looks like. But I've always wanted to know: well, what did it feel like? Mm -hmm. What was it like on the inside? And once you start to en enter into the landscape on that sort of level, suddenly there were, for me, uh, trolls and fairies. There were spirits of the land, seemed to um, be self-evident, and and that's me painting those pictures and it's there was once um a few years ago a showing of dark crystal in paris mm -hmm. and uh afterwards one of the questions was why does dark crystal look like lord of the rings mm. and i had to think about it for a while and then i realized it was alan lee who designed lord of the rings and i live in the same place and as artists we're informed by our own landscape and it shows up in the art, and it showed up in Lord of the Rings, and it showed up in the Dark Crystal. That's fascinating. Um, when I was reading um, the introduction to um, the fairy book that we have with us, the new one, is that around, Celeste? Fairy's Tales. Yes, Fairy's mm -hmm. Tales. Um, I was fascinated by a couple of things. Thanks. Um, and I want to ask you both about them. Maybe I'll ask you about this first, Wendy, is this notion of um, fairies coming to us in these in-between places. And I think, Brian, you mentioned something like in the in-between one heartbeat and the next. And then, Wendy, in your description, you say in, it could be in a chair in your room. It could be in a, under a, a sacred tree of yours that there's this that, – that they emerge from these transitionary places, these in-between places. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? I think that um, our worlds exist basically in the same space, next to each other and in the same space, but mm -hmm. there's that, that fine liminal space where they converge, and that can be anywhere. It, it, we, we find it more easily, I think, out in nature, of course, mm. but... Uh, if we're aware of our surroundings, if we're aware of where we are, uh, really... It is anywhere you can step from one to the other, and it, especially into that in-between space, uh, by being aware. When I was thinking about this, you know, I was thinking about how um, we're in this uh, season of transition right now. When we go mm -hmm. end of August into September, we're moving mm -hmm. out of summer and into the fall, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. And um, these are always, for myself, uh, a period of kind of heightened sense of awareness. Absolutely. I always feel... I don't know how to feel in these times, right? Because we're, things are changing and they're kind of changing rapidly and the trees, trees are changing color and the winds are changing and the clouds are changing and the, and the quality of the light is changing. And I feel like these are opportune times to access these liminal states, right? When, when we watch the natural cycles around us and see them in these uh, periods of flux, these periods of transition. You know, I was a PhD student at the California Institute of Integral Studies and I was there for one of their intensives um, and the people are there studying transformation in all of its manifest uh, manifold forms and um, while we were there at the intensive there was an earthquake off the coast of California and the whole you know the whole building shook and everyone you know and there was a lot of people there that had never been in California so they were pretty traumatized by it and it led to a pretty interesting discussion about how you know, the landscape itself is is in transition. That an earthquake is a is a symbol of sort of physical transformation on a geological level. That that we as people mythologize and interpret in various ways in our experience. But it's very real. But it also exists on this border between the the cultivated and the wild, right? Which again, to me, mm -hmm. reminds me of exactly what it is you're talking about. And it. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, well, I think you just put your finger on that. Yeah. Uh, being the 
cultivated in the wild because mm. fairies traditionally live at the bottom of the garden. You always say there's fairies at the in England we do say there's <laughs> fairies at the bottom of the garden. And for me that what that means is that the garden represents something that's cultured, something that is contained, uh, whereas the beyond the garden is the wilderness. So they live on so fairies live on the edges of everything. So we and we see them at twilight between the, the edge between light and dark and we see them at dawn we see them at noon we see, we see them on the edges of everything we see them on the edges of the shoreline they're almost like mushrooms well they're they're the deep mystery the you know what are, well mushrooms are, are you know are they plant what are they you know yeah. you, you can't tell exactly what they are and this is where sort of fairies always seem to exist so we see them out the corner of our eye we never see them straight on we see them on the edge so they're liminal creatures and, and we see them between waking and sleeping. But it's always in that transitional state it's that transitional. we see them. Yeah. And they're not entirely benevolent, right? This is, I think, a misnomer that one of the things I loved um, in, uh, I believe it was in Labyrinth, right? When uh, Hoggle oh. is, uh, is gassing the fairies right in the beginning of the film. Uh, and that was always so shocking for people <laughs> because people have this notion of fairies having this kind of Tinkerbell quality but even Tinkerbell was kind of a bitch sometimes she, re she, she really was I'm really <laughs> we're really quite keen on mentioning that about Tinkerbell um, um, but uh, yes when I first started um, I really felt that the fairies had been relegated to the nursery that mm. they were for for children uh, that's what people thought they were for children and they're not they might have some childish aspects but they're not uh, I mean childlike aspects but um, but they but traditionally they were really powerful beings because we shared our lives with them we had to because they were often difficult and powerful we had to pl placate them hmm. we had to leave little gifts out for them otherwise your you know your cattle sickened and died your children died I mean awful things happened unless you were you know really good to them which which um was a very, in, a, in an odd way, very positive because it meant you had a relationship with the world mm. and you had a relationship with the spirits of the world that we've rather lost. And so, you know, in our work, we've um, what we try to do is just to mm, inform the world that, that how powerful they, they can be and indeed are. Well, I think we only relegated to them, them to the nursery when we stopped believing in them, mm. Mm. you know. It, were, it was all right for children to believe for just a little bit of their childhood. And that was it when people for thousands of years believed. Yeah. One of the things that I was fascinated with in, in researching this interview was um, Jim Henson talking about, especially with Dark Crystal, is that he, he wanted to, to reintroduce this notion from, from the Grimm tales uh, the, to scare children, that he thought it was a real mistake to, to keep fear away from children. And, and what, what I'm mindful of in, in our conversation so far is that when we talk about these entities as existing in these places kind of beyond the civilized um, and kind of standing at this gateway to the wild, um, is that we've also tried to tame nature in our civilization and, and look at nature as just this kind of benevolent, oh, you go to the beach, oh, you go for a walk in the woods and it's this kind of nice place to go, you know, for rest and relaxation. But nature is also terrifying and and, and, and involves as much destruction as it does creation within the cosmos. And to to introduce children to to that idea through these entities that, that aren't entirely benevolent, but also, I mean, as you said, if you don't appease them, terrible things will happen happen to your family and early Santa Claus myths were not about getting Xboxes and, and PlayStations for the kids. It was about not having your child, you know, stolen in the middle of the night and eaten or something by this entity. And so it, it do you see what I'm, what I'm getting? At? Yeah. I, I mean, I think really what it always boils down to is to pay attention. That's what they're trying to tell us. You know, you, you have to be on your guard for certain things, but you have to um, not walk through the world blindly. Um, so the idea that there are spirits in the land means that you do pay attention, that you do mm, look at the world. I mean, in, in a in, with fairy eyes, <laughs> that um, and you you approach it in a, in a different way, in a much more open way. You you um, they seem to make you aware of the consequences of actions 
that you can't blithely um, just like dig holes in the ground. <laughs> and mm. I mean this in not only, I mean really physically yeah. as well as uh, metaphorically. And we're doing that all the time. Right now across all our nations, um, we are being destructive to the landscape. Um, and, and then we will live at the consequences of that. Yeah. But so um, if, if we perceive and understand that if, if fairies, uh, for instance, could be spirits of land, spirit of place, we need to pay attention about where we build things, how we, uh, which we always used to. That was always part of our culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, in England now, we, you know, we're, building more and more houses, people are rather surprised when they get flooded. <laughs> now, in the old days, there would be either a wise person, a wise woman, or somebody, or they, people would say, oh, but the fairies live there, which often would be a clue that it would, might um, be a destructive place. A good place to build a house. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I think if we listen more <laughs> um, to the fairies, we might be... Um, in a safer place. We live um, on a, a region called the Cascade Subduction Zone here in the Northwest. Um, yes, which you has, do. Which <laughs> has the potential to shake one of uh, what, what is called the worst earthquake in North American history. And um, indigenous people here laugh at all of the, the Europeans who have built permanent settlements mm. here because, as my friends like to remind me, um, it's when, when an earthquake happens, if your teepee fall down, falls down, you pick it up and move it someplace else and put it back up. So when you have a people who are mobile, mm. right, who live on a land that's capable of great destruction, say in a ring of fire or volcanoes or something, they're able to move or not build on those lands. And it comes from this kind of ancient relationship to the land. You're absolutely right. Uh, one one more question before we go to our first break um, to kind of end the fairy discussion for now, unless the fairies bring it back up in the second <laughs> part of the show. Um, uh, you know, I, I we were talking before we went on the air and you said, you know, I, I talk through pictures and I, I don't always, you know, like know how to explain or talk about them because I communicate through the images. Um, so I, I tend to not ask artists about their process because I, I it's a very private thing. And I think in most cases, uh, you would want the art to speak for itself and you aren't in total control of how it speaks to people as well. But I, I do have one question for you two in particular about process, and maybe uh, I'll ask each of you individually when we start with you. Um, these these entities that come to you, do they do they come to you fully formed and then you represent them on the page uh, um, as accurately as you can. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this is um, my friend Antaro Ali, who's a filmmaker and author, he talks about the muses and the archetypes when they when he encounters them. And he's very clear that these are autonomous entities that 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 have their own agendas. Um, and when he's given access to them, he's sort of a conduit for that, but doesn't feel like he's creating these things. And when we go to Young, when we go to Campbell, uh, they, they say the same thing, that the archetypes are things that emerge fully formed to the conscious mind. They do, it's not something we fashion and put clothes on and decide how we want it to look and act. It has its own identity. And um, in certain times establishes relationship with us, uh, a kind of connection um, that we can intuit or sense. And so as an artist, I'm just wondering, is that how you found these things? That's they... absolutely how it works for me when I'm, when I'm sculpting and, you know, not, not doing a commission for somebody that and I know what right. I'm supposed to be doing, but if I'm sculpting for myself or because I feel like I need to need to do something. Yeah. It just comes, it comes through. I don't have to have a picture formed in my mind, but I can start working and it's almost as though I go into a space where I don't realize what it's going to be until I stop and look at it. And then I think, Oh, that's who it is. And then I find that often I can't make it be something it doesn't want to be. Hmm. It really wants to come through as it wants to. And half the time, it isn't at all what I thought it would be. And then you know when you're finished as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there it is. And it's an interesting thing to have created something, brought something into three dimensions. And there it is. And it has an energy about it. I've heard you say that you want to um, give a soul to every piece of work that you produce and and i think i hear you saying yeah. that it has its own soul and it you does. want to make sure that comes through yes i think so very much uh, I, and i think on that note we also are both very careful not to 
not to bring evil into the world. I think there's enough. Hmm. We both feel that there is just quite enough without us doing that. So we very consciously don't do that. That's interesting. One of the questions I had for you later that I was going to ask um, after the break was, where does evil fit into your work? And so I think you just answered it. That's fascinating. Uh, Brian, before we go to break, what about you? Do these do these images come to you fully formed? Um, not exactly. Okay. I mean, the thing about fairies, they have traditional forms. Yeah. Uh, and when Alan Lee and myself worked on the fairies book in 1977, we were working with traditional ideas and traditional images. So there are descriptions of that. Okay. But often um, those descriptions are really based on something else, something deeper. And over the years, I've, be, I've become more and more intrigued by you know, the physical reality of so-called real fairies rather than the ones that are in um, storybooks. Yes. But having said that, of course, the, my trade is picture books. But what I'm doing in those picture books is taking people on a journey. Yeah. So um, I'll start off with uh, things that, um, that people sort of know and understand. It could be a funny gnome, or it could be a pretty fairy. But within the book itself, um, we, we, as we go deeper and deeper, we find that these, uh, the images become more challenging and then eventually we come to a place in fairy where they are, the fairies are expressed as pure abstractions of mm. light. Um, and so... Um, very Dantean. Yes, I, I mean, so, so on the deepest level, they, they are abstractions. And so the way I get to all of those through what I do is through abstractions, um, is that I don't, I'm not very good at picturing anything in my head. So I have to sort of start drawing and play around with lines and gradually something will em will emerge. But in that struggle, um, there is something that is telling me what's right and what's wrong. Because I'm always, I'm always looking to <laughs> See, this is a very extraordinary thing to be painting something to really is actually invisible, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> paint the invisible world and be truthful yeah. about it. And the thing in particular about fairies, of course, is they are uh, mutable and changeable and tricksy and they and they, uh, they they keep changing their form. So to find a form uh, in a painting or a drawing that is a momentary at rest that is also truthful about their inner nature is the, is the difficult bit I attempt to do as an artist. Um, and, and, and so... Um, so we're catching the, them in a moment. Yes, yes, because you can't pin them down. Although, indeed, the irony is I've done books that are about pressing of, pressings of fairies. Yes. Um, but it's that, very quantum, the fairy, isn't it? That's exactly what it's about, because it was in a, indeed trying to make people believe in fairies. And hmm. so uh, in the books, the press fairy books are really about leaving psychic impressions. But, it, but people instinctively sort of um, want to be involved or want to believe in fairies. And this, this gives them the, that ability. And so when we've been working on the other books, um, there's something about the, the fairies uh, that are being rather insistent and wanting to be closer, stepping in closer for me to paint them. Um, and uh, indeed, in those, some of them are, seem to be realistic. There are always changes of proportion, and, and that's coming about. There is an inner energy that I'm portraying um, that... that propels, I think, uh, the, the, the fairy forms into a meaning. Well, for our listeners that um, grew up with the fairies book uh, in the 70s and 80s, I can highly recommend this, uh, the newer one, The Fairies Tales. Not only is the art exquisite, but um, the, the accompanying stories, I think, really play nicely because they're short and they, they kind of capture the same idea of you're just getting a glimpse you're getting a moment of a kind of flash of inspiration here um all right well we're coming up to our first break this is andy gervich i'm sitting with brian and wendy froud and you're listening to on the block radio we'll be back after this welcome to the beauty and truth lab we're coming to you live from your repressed memories of paradise Reminding you that you can have anything you want if you will just ask for it in an unselfish way. Welcome to the end of your nightmares, Beauty and Truth fans. 
The world is young, your soul is free, and a naked celebrity is dying to talk to you about your most intimate secrets right now. Just kidding. In fact, the world is young, your soul is free, and at any moment you will feel a flood of ecstatic compassion for salamanders, oak trees, clouds, toasters, convenience store clerks, and even the ocean itself. I am your host. My name is the Sacred Janitor at the Edge of Time. And I'm proud to announce that this is a perfect moment. It's a perfect moment for many reasons, but especially because you are on the verge of finally figuring out exactly what it is you really want more than anything else. Bravo, viva, whoopee, ooh, you're Hallelujah, Abracadabra. Bravo, Viva, Whoopi, Ooh, Eureka. Hallelujah, Abracadabra. The Beauty and Truth Labs experiments are brought to you by the pine trees whose seeds are so tightly compacted within their protective covering that only the intense heat of a forest fire can free them and allow them to sprout. Bravo, viva, whoopee, ooh, eureka, hallelujah, abracadabra. Bravo, viva, whoopee, ooh, eureka, hallelujah, abracadabra. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Andy Gervich. You're listening to On The Block Radio in the house with producer Mike, assistant producer Celeste, a couple of kitties. What are their names again? Uh, Maya and Nora. Maya and Nora who uh, you listeners might hear off and on in the program, <laughs> and also our guests today, Brian and Wendy Froud. Um, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about working with Jim Henson. Both of you worked with Jim Henson and George Lucas, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what that was like um, to work with people um, who were creative geniuses but also have a history of being a little bit eccentric. Um, Brian, let's start with you. Um, one of the things I'm fascinated with is the... Um, from my research, I found that the Dark Crystal, uh, that he, at the time, was really influenced by the Seth material, um, the, the Jane Roberts book, uh, the woman who was channeling this individual, uh, Seth. And um, I read that he made everybody, including you, read the book before working on the film. Uh, Jim wouldn't make you do anything. Well, right, right, right. <laughs> um, I, I mean, we, we read it. Um, I think it was his own personal, he was felt connected to it mm -hmm. personally. But um, but our experience was that he was also connected to, to many other things. Yeah. So when he was in England, um, he was really interested in the, the spirituality of the landscape mm -hmm. there. So, you know, he went to Glastonbury and was really interested in ley lines. And he'd gone to Findhorn um, and explored all that. And he, and he really liked the, you know, the mythology of the ancient landscape. So as being an English person, and I was interested in that. I brought a lot of that to the movie, and yeah. I, I embedded embedded that into the, the designs of the you know the the, the clothing and in the, the designs of the buildings and the architecture, and all that really showed up uh, in the the book we did afterwards. So um, Jim's spirituality sort of permeated it, mm. but I don't. But it was, and his indeed his idea for the the splitting up of the personalities and the and the resolve of that, you know. And he was really intrigued by the nature of good and evil, 
I mean, we've had, I've had people come and say that they couldn't see it as a child because their parents thought it was the devil's yeah, film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I said, well, actually, it was completely the opposite. Was he like, shocked by that response? Well, I think we all were yeah. because that was not not in its nature at all. And I know that the seminaries have used it to demonstrate, you know, for them, the nature of good and evil. Yeah, I find, um, you know, speaking just for myself, uh, that, you know, as a child, uh, that work, Jim's work, was one of the first places I was really in, in a popular culture way introduced to, like, humanist values. You know what I mean? Like, as a child, I was really influenced by this material to sort of become a better person, to be a good neighbor, to embrace other people, to embrace diversity. It was really the first place I had, had come into contact with that. And I, I think... Um, you know, what I'm fascinated with, Wendy, you said something earlier that um, about the, the sort of relegating fairies to the to the nurse we happen when we stop believing in them. And I think in the 1960s and 70s were an interesting time in this country uh, and maybe abroad because um, Western civilization had had and many people had pointed this out. You know, Nietzsche did, Young did and others, Campbell, uh, that we had become kind of unmoored and kind of cast adrift in a sea without a, a, a clear mythological heritage anymore. People. You know, you had certain people who believed in certain kinds of fundamentalist, monotheistic religions, but beyond that, the culture had lost its connection to magic, its connection to the shadow, its connection to the unknown, into the mystery, and these awe-inspiring sort of states of existence. And um, you know, again, this is fine for sort of childhood play, but uh, an adult doesn't doesn't believe in any of these things. And uh, what I see in this time period when people are studying the Urantia book, when they're reading uh, um, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, when they're looking at the uh, the Seth material, is is that exactly this, that there's a kind of uh, a thirst for a reawakening, that you, you find people that are, that are not satisfied with the traditional monotheistic, top-down, controlling religions, but are looking for a connection back to their Anglo roots, back to their European traditions, back to something that roots them in the earth, roots them in the cosmos and the sky and, and, and connects them back to one another in more substantive ways. And I really, you know, I said in the beginning, our, the, our show is called um, Authentic People Doing Beautiful Things. And I don't know two people that embody that more because all of that that I just said, I really see in your work. And I saw it in Jim's work, too. It was for children, but it always also was not for children. It was very much trying to emulate a kind of Mm. new way to be in the world. Does that does that make any sense? It does. I think I uh, was at an advantage when I came to work um, on Dark Crystal because I had already read the Seth material. I was I was very much a seeker mm -hmm. in in that direction anyway. So uh, Jim and I really related on that level. And it was easy to bring how we felt into what we did. And I think all of us were... were I don't know if we weren't necessarily picked for that. We were picked for our talent, but um, but we did all seem to agree, for the most part, on on how important you know creating your own reality. All of all of the things that Jim really wanted to have in the film at Express. Yeah, I get the sense that, that when you were working on a project like this, that it wasn't just a commercial endeavor, that there was a kind of... Anything but. A belief system. Absolutely. That was oh, really, absolutely. Yeah. I think that was more important than anything. We, we felt that we were really at the beginning of a big adventure. It felt like that. And it felt like we were creating something beyond ourselves. I've read some, uh, and we'll get to Empire Strikes Back in a minute, but I've read some stuff from folks out of the Lucas camp that said that they felt the same way working on the first two movies. Um, but after that, it became a kind of toy selling franchise. And and they can understand why that is because of the, the large amounts of money involved, but that, that the f sort of focus shift shifted in, the, in that project as well, that there was a real kind of creative vision in the beginning, but then it kind of got overrun by commercial interest by the end. But it's, it's interesting to see that Henson really tried to hold that, hold that line. And, uh, I especially think, with dark crystal, especially much with more than crystal. labyrinth, yeah. but, but totally with dark crystal. Now you two met on the set of dark crystal. Is that correct? We met in the workshop in the we, workshop. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. First the, day. the first day there was a, there was a two week sort of, um, I don't know, experimental time when Jim got together, but I think it was about six people to see with Brian to see what uh, we would come up with and you came up with a with a wife out of it yeah. <laughs> I did that was uh, yeah yes that, 
Beats being paid. Yeah. <laughs> you got paid too. Yeah, and I got paid. You got paid right. and wow. a wife. Yeah, yeah. yeah was that want? part of the contract? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great to, like, to, um, I was in those days really pretty inarticulate and very shy. And <laughs> so I sort of was a little church mouse, I think, when I <laughs> came there. So it was wonderful being. Playing hard to get. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful to be in the workshop uh, there in New York uh, with a bunch of people, um, you know, who, who have been dedicated to do this, this project and just sitting there. And we, um, at first I didn't know quite what, how to, to say what I wanted so I did lots of little drawings and then I also made ma maquettes I made little models mm -hmm. of these figures and so people could work from and so um, but when you know Jim and Frank would come in and we'd all sit around and just talk about you know what the what the characters were this uh, is Frank Oz Frank Oz yeah, yes yeah. Um, of course I blame both of them for the for the Skeksis because <laughs> oh. I was I mean mine were very fairly monstery I suppose but they just encouraged me to make them worse oh Oh, okay. They so, loved monsters. <laughs> yeah. They they loved to play, and they were and they knew how delicious these guys were going to be. Now, know. speaking of delicious, I read somewhere that you got inspiration from eating lobster dinners. <laughs> well, uh, it's for... because when I got to New York, <laughs> having come from you know a country landscape, I I I'm, I'm in New York, and I think, well, you know, where are the trees? Where is that? So I went into Central Park. In those days, it was actually I was hoping to see like nannies in Mary Poppins nan nannies, yeah. <laughs> you know, pushing babies, but it was it was just frenetic with loud music, and I thought I couldn't find it there. So I found that uh, looking for nature, I found mm -hmm. it in, in, in lobster shells. <laughs> so it would show up. Having you know. eaten the lobster. Oh, yeah, yeah, of them, course. Yes, <laughs> and then take them back. And then, because a lot of um, the early days was playing. Yeah, in a sense, um, and so they had um, spray booths and and the materials that they were because they were making muppets, and so and they had in particular um, things which they called wacky stacks, which were actually plastic round balls which they used for the eyes. And um, I remember sort of going into spray booths and just spraying colours on them, and uh, and that they sudden suddenly looked like planets to me and I got some wire and I joined them all together and that went to one side and I started making um, like cups and various mm. things and just would cut things up, glue things together and all that didn't make any sense at the beginning but gradually as we would, and it was five years of my life to make this film, gradually near the end, um, you know, we suddenly said, oh well that's an orrery and that's, you know, where we got... Um, Ogre's landscape, you know, went in there, and then some, and the way that the Skeksis looked and feel, because we just sort of later on we sculpted all the bones and the shapes, but mm. up to then it was a lot of collage work. But we were all able to experiment. That was one of the gifts that Jim gave us was the freedom to experiment and and discover things that we wouldn't have been able to do if we'd been locked down into. You know, just making specific characters at the beginning. I think the more expensive a movie gets, the oh. more commercial interests get involved. And then now with computer animation, the less likely you can give artists that ability to play. No, we nobody will have that chance again, I wouldn't yeah. think. I don't think it will come again. Which is a shame. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. everybody wants to know exactly what it is. And we didn't know what it was. Hmm. And we just knew it was going to be wonderful. <laughs> and it meant that we... And so in the playing aspect, because we, uh, we were still experimenting... Um, how to make these things. We knew it was going to be puppetry, but as Jim would say, puppetry like you've never seen before. Mm. Well, how do you do that? So we played around making a lot of prototype work to just to try and figure out how these things would move. So my designs were very loose at the beginning because I knew there was a, lots of stages in between. So, um, you know, what presumably on a normal film would be a few weeks work as I said turns out to be five years of my life because day in and day out I was working with the creative team to um, keep moving the, the the feelings and the emotions of the characters in a in the direction that was um, felt right but a lot of that came from knowing and understanding how we were going to make the move so a lot of my final designs were was a, a way to um accommodate how you did that how you hid people underneath how mm. you hid the, the mechanics or accommodating um the puppeteer's hands because their hand size was very important you had to 
accommodate that and mechanics. It was complicated. And they were massive, right? I heard that there was five, six people in some, in these suits or working them sometimes. Underneath uh, sometimes, them. yeah. Underneath, underneath yeah. Yes. And it would be exhausting. I heard uh, Jim was in a costume and he can only maybe stand full, fully erect in it for like 20 seconds or so without having to... Oh, that was the Skeksis. The Skeksis yes, yeah. uh, although Jim was uh, brilliant to his puppeteers. Oh, for he sure. was very kind to them. And so uh, for the Gotham, we did one build on it, and uh, Jim could come and look at it and say, it looks great, how heavy is it? And mm. they would say, and they said, build it again. Mm. And they went through several builds as they just tried to make them lighter and lighter. As light as possible. Um, and also, we always were very careful how you got... Uh, get people in and out quickly and also how to get air to them quickly so a lot of the you would suspend people right to give them a break because then they would be kind of yes weightless yeah but still in the suits it was it was indeed arduous work I don't know um, if anybody, I mean, maybe there's one or two of our listeners that were, were born under a rock that don't know the plot of The Dark Crystal, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about the mythology in it. You mentioned, uh, just to briefly ske- sketch it, so we have the Skeksis and the Mystics, right, which are two a split uh, race of, of people that uh, there's a, a crystal at the center of this palace that has been uh, shattered and a section of it is missing um, and it's uh, broken this race into two sections a kind of benevolent wise monk race and then this kind of evil overlord race right and uh, and then there's an individual named Jen and what's his race again? He's a Gelfling a Gelfling um, who is uh, in, a, in a Tolkien-esque way sort of chosen to uh, find the shard and, and repair the crystal. And then when that happens, these two sects come back together and form the, you know, the sort of the singular individuals that are made up of both these good and bad sides um, and back into the sort of higher state they were in. And I was fascinated with this as a, as a kid um, and now as an adult because this hits on a mythology that exists in many cultures. And I don't know if you've heard the, the Native American saying that in every person's heart there are two wolves and one of them is compassion and empathy, and the other one is anger and rage and jealousy. And depending on which one you feed is the one that grows. And um, everything, even down into the biblical traditions, there's this notion that people have this capacity for great love, for great wisdom, for great caring and creativity, but also this capacity for great dest- destruction and and, uh, and great and to cause great harm. And um, that's a profound thing as, as a thing to teach children. And I wonder, I mean, you mentioned it a little bit before, uh, but can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, was, what was the inspiration for that, to put that in the film? Oh, uh, Jim really was, well, was keen on that. So he introduced this idea to us, which we sort of understood. Because, um, uh, and it still speaks to us today, it mm-hmm. seems to me, because we're, we're, as a world, we're becoming very polarized. And so um, people make this grand decision that they are good and everybody else is evil. Yeah. And we, we were indeed saying that, in fact, the good and evil should be in balance um, and it's within, within us all. And we can't be arrogant enough because the idea in the film that the, the race before was arrogant and, and decided to split off the, the darker side of themselves and then it, suddenly everything is in, in a destructive mode because when you look at the both of the characters, the Skeksis um, you know, seemingly are the bad guys and the Mystics are the good guys, but the Mystics have their faults as well because yeah. they're sort of rather um, inadequate and don't have, don't have much force yeah. to them and that's a problem as well. So it's only that when everything can be brought together again uh, and uh, that everything becomes healed because it's, it's energetically it's starting to work together. And then there is transcendence, uh, which is, I think, was quite extraordinary. I was, um, there was going to be more layers on the beings at the end. At the, uh, there was a bit of a rush to finish the film. <laughs> so I was a bit disappointed because I wanted... Uh, if you actually look at them, there are um, places which I designed in the costumes which were going to be really um, chakras. I mean, they were going to be worlds of light going through the whole of the figures. So it, it was a, going to be a truly spectacular... Well, it's pretty spectacular, as it is. But oh, I think it ended up pretty spectacular. <laughs> so, George Lucas once name. said on your last point about the end of the film, he once said that films are never finished, they're abandoned. Indeed, yes. And, and I think at some point you just run out of time or money or both, and then you just have to you have to wrap 
wrap it up. Yeah. Right, if something takes forever. Uh, although it's, it's it's really interesting to be talking about this as you, know, you just said about it being a myth. You know, at the times, some people said, you know, well, I don't know. You just seem to give the story away. I said, or they said, oh, it was so simplistic. simplistic. You know, it was just, and you know, you think what? Well, you but it was always it. meant to be a myth, and yeah. it was always meant to be as you get into the story to have something that was sort of familiar about it, mm-hmm. as if it's been told for thousands of years. Yeah. That was the idea. Idea. And indeed, uh, if you look at the design of it, which is uh, which is me, uh, I, in all the creatures I do, there's often something familiar about them. But you can't quite exactly say what they are. You can't tell what's the skexis. You know, is it a bird? Is it a dragon? What is it? Right. What, and the mystic, you know, is it a dog? Is it? <laughs> what is? What are these things? But they're usually amalgams of all sorts of things. So there's often you have um, a, a feeling of comfort in seeming to know what they are and yet surprised because you can't quite figure out what it is and I think the whole of the Dark Crystal has that quality to it and why I think it still has a, such a resonance Yeah, I now. think that's right. I was going to ask you actually in the next segment about one of the reasons you keep anticipating my questions Let's Get out of my head, sir. Uh, actually, you did it too. Uh, but uh, why you think these films have endured uh, you know, and, and only seem to be gaining in popularity but we'll get, we'll, I want to revisit that in the next break. I want to ask a follow-up question on what you just said um, and then we're going to take another break because um, it kind of goes to something Wendy was saying earlier um, and the the Skeksis and the Mystics were originally, I read, going to have a, a language that was kind of Indo-European rooted and then with English translations. And I think a test audience, is, Americans are always so lazy, we don't want to read subtitles. And so that might have had something to do with it. But mm-hmm. I also read that Jen was supposed to be blue originally, like the Hindu god Rama. Um, somewhere I read that. I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, yeah, we actually did try a blue version of him. <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I'm, and then you mentioned the chakra possibility as well. And so I'm really interested when I look to your work, I tend to see, um, a kind of, uh, an Anglo, a Celtic kind of bent to, to the material that's very tied to the landscape and the mythologies of that region of the world. And I'm wondering, is that, is that where your work really centers? Uh, have you explored Asian myths or, or uh, Central and South American tales and and you know i see at least in the dark crystal sense jim trying to bring in some of these other mythologies and do what you said earlier have things be familiar and strange at the same time and that's exactly what you were just talking about i mean i can only really do what i uh, i do what i know Mm -hmm. i mean especially when i'm painting fairies i sort of paint the guys that are around me yeah okay um and so definitely in dark crystal though um it was based on our own landscape was based on celtic things however uh, and uh, it does seem that the mystics very much of Native American, yeah. a lot of their philosophy and actually the way they look. And so we were trying to find, I think, um, a landscape and indeed um, characters, you know, mythological characters that were um, belong to the whole world in, mm-hmm. in a sense. Um, yeah. And Wendy, what about in your case? How does how do other mythologies inform your work if they do? I, I think they do I, because. I grew up reading yeah. a lot about different mythologies. Mm. They're just a part of the way I see things and the way I interpret things. Um, I don't think I would ever go for any specific, just take things from yeah. wherever I can find This will be Hindu and this will be... Oh, yeah, no, 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 I don't yet, think I'd yeah. ever do that. But, uh, but I think, you know, again, Jim and you and me and a couple of the other people on the team, all were really steeped in this already. This is what I love uh, before we go to break here in my work in studying Paleolithic art is I find this art comes from a time, um, especially the, the cave art in southern oh, France. It's so beautiful. It comes from a time when we um, were advanced enough as modern humans to sort of see real intention and complexity in the art um, and layers of, of, inter- of meaning in it. But it's archaic enough uh, because it comes from a people who are still really connected to the land and to the cosmos in a way that modern humans in general are not. And it also comes from a time when we weren't differentiated yet that much as a species. And so there weren't French and Italian and German. There weren't Christian and Muslim and Jew. There were just people. I mean, sure, there were clans. They had loose clan associations. But the art is kind of universally human. Um, and th- and I think it speaks very powerfully for that reason. And again, why I keep coming back to the work you do is I think there's elements of that. It's very much rooted in a place 
and in what's around you and it has that element of it that is you know particularly english you know in folklore but there's a kind of universal aspect to it as well that hits to what you said brian are these images that are kind of universally human mm. and not just mm. encultured if that makes sense mm. i mean definitely yeah. dark crystal yeah, i mean that uh, i knew i had to invent a whole mythology i had to invent a whole culture so the simple way was to choose some symbols hmm. which i did you know so there the, are the spirals the triangles oh the spirals are amazing so all yeah. these things that are, are, are universal to all cultures i mean i have to laugh now when i when i see the weather forecasts to see you know these wonderful big weather systems that come in that are spirals yeah. of course and um because it's always been mysterious um the, the spirals and the shapes that are carved into rocks that mm -hmm. we have in england you know what's the meaning of that and it does seem to me that they you know you touched on it they're cosmic mm. symbols they they, they they you know speak of the energetic level of the world and i'm sorry Something that you cannot see with your eyes, that you have to experience it and, and feel it and see it through other means. And so um, I think that's embedded in Dark Crystal. Seems like you've made a career out of doing the impossible, huh? Painting the invisible puppetry that's never been done before. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> right. well, somebody you, you like has to, to accept do it. these challenges. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take our final break. This is Andy Gervich. You're listening to On the Block Radio. We are here with Wendy and Brian Froud, and we will be back in a minute. You're listening to On the Block. Stay tuned for more stimulating conversation with our guests. I wasn't prepared to be a caregiver to mom, but a little over a year ago, we realized she couldn't take care of herself without our help. And well, how could I not be there for her? I had no idea how hard it would be and just what I would need to know. Things I never thought of, like how to improve her mood and even for me, ways to stay positive. Luckily, I found the Caregiving Resource Center from AARP. It had articles about the basics that got me started, but also information about the hurdles I was facing in this new role. I could even connect with experts and hear from others who had been in my place. I know this road we're on isn't an easy one, but I'm really happy to have the extra help for her and for me. Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org caregiving. Articles, tips, and tools to help you both care for your loved one and care for yourself. This message is brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. In all cultures, in all spiritual pursuits, entering into an altered state of consciousness allows us to converse with the divine. There's a borderland between this conscious waking world and the other world where the spirits, ancestors, or gods live. Under certain circumstances, that border opens up and inexorably pulls in the trance journeyer who leaves his body in trance in this world but moves into the other as spirit. This is the same experience of going for the light at the end of the tunnel that near-death survivors report. If you're a shaman, you train for years to be able to control those trance states, to enter them willingly, leave your body behind and send your spirit into a vortex, the portal between the worlds. That vortex is the center of the labyrinth, the focus of the journey to the spirit world. Thank you for listening to On The Block, free radio that's worth twice what you paid for it. Welcome back, everyone. We are in our final segment of the program. This is Andy Gervich. You're listening to On The Block Radio, and we are with our guests, Brian and Wendy Froud. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. I want to ask you some questions about Labyrinth now, if you don't mind. You up for that? Yep. <laughs> Um, in doing the research, and you know, before I go forward, I just want to let you know the show 
Um, it's about mythology. It's about serious things. It's about authentic people doing beautiful things. But it's also a bit off color. I like to make jokes from time to time. I have no idea if anybody finds these funny or not. But, <laughs> but I have a sense of humor. And, um, and it started to come out in researching Labyrinth. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about is your son, Toby, <laughs> plays the baby. He Toby does. in Labyrinth, right? And um, in in preparing for the program, um, my, uh, my wife and I watched the movie again last night, and and I and I want and I want to point a few things out. Um, the child is crying hysterically for most of the for most of the film, right? And either he's a wonderful actor. Or he was actually terrified of these puppets on set. <laughs> he was never terrified of the oh, puppets on set. Okay. Um, in fact, he from the time he was very small was taken to the workshop so he could meet all the puppets. So he's he, friends with these things. He was friends with these things. But he was often frustrated and angry because when he when he was in the cot and crying, it was because he knew that a cot was for bedtime or oh, nap time. And it wasn't want to go into bed. bedtime or nap time. And he didn't know why he was there. And he was just really... So that worked to your worked. advantage. Oh, yeah. We knew that if we put him in there and it wasn't the right time, he would just get really angry. That's and utterly fantastic. But he really... He enjoyed himself. The other time yeah. where he is crying is because, um, especially with the David Bowie set, it was the, they would start the music really loudly, um, and that he, it just startled him. So once it got going, he was all right because he loved all the creatures, That's and he was wanted to dance as well. Yeah, uh, I was thinking on the way over here that, um, to my knowledge, he occupies a really uh, when I asked to interview i was contacted back by by his wife sarah is mm -hmm. that correct and then a thought occurred to me on the way over here that uh, here's a man who's been actually cradled by david bowie but who's married to a, a woman and i thought the only other man on the planet that i know that that's true of is mick jagger <laughs> oh, oh i never thought about that <laughs> yeah right so that's an interesting uh, yeah. tidbit and pass along to him or not and also he married a sarah yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. There's something to that, I yeah. think. Uh, Michael Jackson was considered to play Jareth at one point. We're not sure quite how, how serious we have to take this. We certainly talked about it in I meetings. I mean, Jim's but... always mentioned that. But what he, what he, um, we were, I have to be honest, we were quite horrified with the very idea, which he backtracked from uh, and claimed it was only that he really wanted something like a, like a pop star. Might have but, been a good idea to not have Toby in the movie if Michael. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but I think what Jim really wanted was um, somebody that was instantly recognizable mm -hmm. because what, what we wanted in, because we were trying trying to approach the, the story in, in, a, in like a different way, you know, in a different way, what, a gob, what you expect a Goblin King to be like. And so if he can, if the, the actor can bring with it all this other story, which is being a, you know, a personality, is what Jim really wanted. And in fact, so Bowie in the end was the perfect one because he has this otherworldly quality to him and so he was perfect for the part and we were all fans yeah i think <laughs> and i think a significant part of why the movie has such staying power too i don't think it's the only reason or maybe not even the biggest but it's certainly one of the reasons why the people return to the film mm. I mean, we didn't really know what the film was in the end. I mean, I think part of us were slightly disappointed because, because two, a couple of things had happened. One was that Jim wanted to have human beings in it. Mm -hmm. Not Before, it was just pure puppetry. Yeah, in Dark Crystal, right. Um, um, but from that, I immediately knew, and I had this vision of a baby surrounded by goblins. Um, and that sort of set the, the story, set where we were going with it. Um, and then so uh, when we finished, we thought, oh, was that it? You know, because you always want to, everything you do to be really, really wonderful or something. Because once it's finished, you can't do anything more to it. But we've all been astonished about how its story speaks to people and mm -hmm. speaks to teenage girls, new yes, generations. Especially to teenage girls, it speaks, yeah. still does. Have they told you why? They seem to think it's their story mm -hmm. somehow. That I think um, without us really grasping it, that we were um, working with maybe psychological archetypes, it seems to me. And that's, um, 
that's why often I think that the, the, like the character of the Goblin King is probably misunderstood mm. by certain people, but understood by maybe girls. Because, I mean, I deliberately in the costume designed lots of elements in there. Because, um, you know, first of all, you accept he's a pop star. Yeah. There are things like his swagger stick, if you look at it carefully, though it's a jewel and has a crystal ball on it, is actually a microphone. So I knew that he could use it like a microphone. Hmm. Um, that um, that he has a leather jacket, which is sort of you know like a a leather boy that wrote that sort of tough thing, but at the same time it has armor on it. Yeah, and this is a medieval knight. Um, that um, there are that he is also um, Byronic. Um, he is like Heathcliff. That's yeah. the idea. He also. Um, because of his uh, my, the infamous tight pants, which a lot of women over the years have thanked me for, <laughs> um, was actually a reference to a ballet dancers. So there are lots of uh, images that teenage girls really relate to, or you know, conflated into a single. And Bowie figure. himself is a kind of mythology, isn't he? I mean, he's a he's he was oh, a symbol yeah. for not only a kind of absolute sexual masculinity, like you're talking about, but he was also kind of I- I- iconically gender fluid. Yes. In a lot of ways. He so was an he androgynous was a, a figure. Yeah. yeah. So in you know in every sense he is um, uh, like fairy like you know mm-hmm. he is a fairy king. I mean not just a goblin king. He's a, he's a you know fairy king. So he's he's changeable and mutable. Did uh, did Toby? Pee on David? <laughs> That's one of the stories out there. Toby, I'm so sorry if you're listening to this. I'm so <laughs> sorry that this was brought up. Well, yes. Oh, the the reason this. was because um, in Toby's little stripy pajamas, we couldn't use regular diapers because they were just too bulky. Mm-hmm. And they really didn't look good on screen. So we used um, a couple of layers of waterproof pants but unfortunately they weren't as waterproof as they could have been oh that is fantastic he was very good about it he was David was yes <laughs> he was he only I, asked for a new pair of gloves oh nice <laughs> i read somewhere also that in the magic dance uh sequence the baby was it toby in the recording studio or a different baby that the baby uh, wasn't that was, gurgling as, enough and so bowie had to actually that was record. actually yeah that was that was david bowie doing yeah, it actually do that yeah he did <laughs> he liked to do stuff like that <laughs> i uh the 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 notion of the labyrinth itself. I have a colleague named Jody Lorimer, who uh, who's written extensively on uh, a wonderful book on the Minotaur and the Labyrinth, and examined it not only in its uh, sort of Greek representation, but in others. And I was just reading an article this morning, again in preparation for our interview, about labyrinths that have been built into like prisons and mental hospitals and other places as a, as a place for meditation. That they've actually scientifically shown that other, not like a maze, but a labyrinth is separate from a maze, and that oh, a, person, a lab that you walk. Yeah, yeah, that you walk, and uh, it actually helps people with stress. It helps mm. people with PTSD. It helps for meditation. And uh, Jody's work is in, in particular on the Minotaur figure and on this kind of this beast like man like creature that, again, is kind of half half exists on the sort of edge of things that exist at the center of the labyrinth is the key and that this is a, a person confronting um, an aspect of their animal selves. Absolutely. Right? And, and so I think this. You know, when you say teenage girls come to you uh, and say this movie tells their story, I, I wonder if this isn't a bit of it, that this is a story about a girl um, moving from childhood to adulthood who's kind of finding that power within herself, finding that animal self. I, I, I think so. when we started, we didn't know quite where it was going to lead to, but definitely when we got to the end. <laughs> we knew that that's what that, it was. That's what <laughs> it was The about. most interesting yeah, way yeah. to make art, yeah. right, is to not be uh, absolutely. preconceived. Um, I, I, I do believe that. I mean, because when I work on the books, I work on a painting I I have to uh, uh, let the book itself tell me what it wants eventually so you can't you you have to shape and form it eventually but you can't do that too soon and so I think the, the the gift that Jim Henson gave us with both the movies is that we didn't they hadn't figured out exactly what it was going to be at the beginning and um it People are horrified by this now in the in the business that so you can't do that. Well, yes, you can, um, and and by doing it, you I think you get a resonance 
that often is missing uh, in many movies nowadays, and that, and they both the, the resonance of both movies keep keep them alive mm. at the moment because I think it's because they're quite they're sort of unfinished they're un they're not being rounded off there's sort of lots of edges to it lots of ways in and lots of ways of interpreting it so I think that every time you view both the movies you get something else from it that yeah. you didn't know was there the i read recently that the the puppet the hoggle puppet is at the alabama airport is that true <laughs> that uh, that that uh, there was a, a baggage attendant that opened up a suitcase and this puppet was in it and and it's this and it's this puppet and that it's remains in the unclaimed baggage museum at the alabama airport i think it all depends who you talk to i mean we've seen pictures of i'm not sure no i'm not sure I but don't. i know some people i've talked to in henson say it is so and mm-hmm. i was sort of deny it um but it's it's one of those mysteries of why it won't be released <laughs> or why won't they why won't they come and get, get it, it. i we thought maybe that. you guys could swing through alabama on your way back to england and just gra- break the glass and take back. the thing <laughs> you certainly have a... right to it don't yes. you <laughs> um, we'd have to buy him a seat though yeah <laughs> uh one of the things i read was that um uh, Maurice Sendak was not pleased with some of the similarities to his work that he felt were yes, in his appa- films. Yes, apparently. Um, and, um, I mean, the, the problem is that uh, he thought the story was taken from outside over there. Yeah. And, um, so, I mean, uh, and Jim and he were friends and had been always talking about making a film together. Now, the problem was um, that... Uh, the, we know where the story came from because mm. it was like Wendy and myself in a limousine <laughs> in San Francisco when we had a showing of Dark Crystal and really? we thought, well, we'd had, a, you know, we were exhausted by it all, so we'd had enough. We said, never again. And Jim suddenly said... Well, Jim was in the limousine too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, yeah. Should we make another one? We said, oh, well, why not? <laughs> and so, I mean, he, he was at that time said, well, you know, he, maybe we could do something about Indian mythology. And I... And he's, and he, I said, well, I don't know nothing really about that, <laughs> nor did he. So um, I, you know, I sort of came up with goblins hmm. uh, just out of desperation. And he said, well, that's great. And then he said he wanted the human beings in it. And then I said, well, baby, and we suddenly had this picture. Um, and then he said, well, what's the story? And I said, well, um, you know, because goblins steal babies. That's traditional. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, but where is it? And, I, and then I came up with labyrinth and where that came from. I said, labyrinth is a, is a metaphor. Not only is it a place, but it's a metaphor for many, many yeah. things. And we left it at that. And I went back to England and started painting pictures of what characters might be in it. And then we started to develop the story. So the, the, the germ of the idea came from European um, stories as, as indeed Maurice's came from but we, but it's the same um, we didn't we didn't you know intend to steal anything from him um, and indeed we didn't but it didn't help I suppose that in the in the film as you go across the you know the, the copy girls, of where the wild things there are, is because yeah. when I when I sure saw, saw the rushes I said Jim where where are my books and he said <laughs> oh I forgot so you know because I had done many uh, in those days, sure. quite children's books. Sure. You know, so, but, so it would have helped if mine had yes. been there. But, but his was, you know, Morris very Hinsley. prominently there. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I got from the films, and I want to move on to a couple of other questions before we run out of time. But when I view the films, I see um, so much homage and similarities to other mythological trends, things that even came after. I see Lord of the Rings. I see Star Wars. I see Harry Potter. I see a million things, but they never felt derivative. It just feels to me that, again, that there's this kind of cachet of images and of tropes uh, that that exist in this sort of region that that artists get access to. And so different artists will access them in different times in different ways and then see another artist accessing that same archetype and think, hey, you stole that from me. But the thing is, is these archetypes don't belong to anybody and they visit multiple artists sometimes, right, yeah. and speak in Indeed. different ways. Indeed, I think if you're being true to the material or being open, um, the archetypes have to sh- shine through. Mm. They certainly do in my art, but I'm always trying to find a, a, you know, another way of 
presenting them. And so, in, but in like Labyrinth, for instance, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the, the story sort of came from me just creating characters, wow. or sort of understanding how um, how you what puppets could do and what they couldn't do. So I was always looking for creating a creature that didn't have to like run around too much or had like twin aspects to it, you know, or hats that talk, that sort of thing. Um, and that um, often gives it um, sort of an archetypal feel to it because it gives another worldly character to it. Meanwhile, um, you know, the story was being developed. Near the end, uh, Jim wanted the, 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 the script to be tweaked before we started a film and uh, Terry Jones from Monty Python came in so he loved what we were doing but he just noticed sketchbooks of mine on the desk and just flicked through it and said oh we've got to do this do that that so he picked out a lot of little sketches which were the door knockers hmm. you know the uh, the fireys um, the uh, well a lot of the a lot of the characters and we did a, a massive rebuild at the last minute as he wrote them into the script wow. and it, I think it was because why that worked so well is that I'm British and Jim being American though he loved the, the British culture and he loved the, the fairy tales it's more ingrained with us exactly what it is, you know, and I knew mm. it was going to be sort of Alice in Wonderlandy, and there were other aspects to it. So Terry Jones got it completely. Got the sort of I could aspect, write yeah. that, that in. Yeah. Um, one of the Henson projects that I wanted to ask if you either were involved in was the, um, I know he did a couple of these, and I'm not sure how many, but these kind of retelling of classical mythology. So the one that I still show in my world literature class is the Orpheus and Eurydice uh, segment. And I'm not sure, do you know these, and did you work on these? No, I worked uh, at the very beginning of the Storyteller okay. project. Yeah. Um, and so in, in particular, the first one they did was Hans, uh, My Hedgehog. But not the, not the cla classic. Not the, not the classical one. Mythology, no. no. Can we ask you a few Empire Strikes Back questions? Do you sure. Mind? Um, you know, I, I have to ask you, Wendy, about uh, about Empire. Um, to me and to a lot of folks, it's their favorite Star Wars film. And ironically, and I, and I don't want to use the show here to, to pick on George at all because it's, it's his <laughs> brainchild. But ironically, it's the film he had the least to do with. He didn't write the script. He didn't direct it. Lawrence Kasdan wrote it. Um but I, I don't know if that's why people love the film the most. I think it, it, it has an authenticity to it. There's a, there's a darkness to that particular movie that isn't in the other movies. But um, I know for a lot of us, the, the, the main reason we like it is this Yoda character. And it's the whole sequences in the Dagobah system. And I just want to ask you a little bit about, um, about working on the project, about working on the, the puppet, where it came from, how that all came together. And I have a few questions about CG Yoda uh -huh. <laughs> and your thoughts on that as well in a minute. Okay. But how did, how did this all come about, this project? Well, I was already working on Dark Crystal mm -hmm. and working on Jan and Kira, the Gelflings. Yeah. And, um, and George had a lot to do with that project, right? He or a little didn't. to do. He helped. I thought he helped edit. Or was that Labyrinth? That was Labyrinth. Okay. That was okay, Labyrinth. Sorry. It was Gary Kurtz that that was a part of uh, Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal. Okay. But um, we knew that there was going to be uh, a character in The Empire Strikes Back that was a puppet, mm -hmm. and that Frank Oz was going to be puppeteering it, and uh, Stuart Freeborn, the makeup artist, was was going to be creating this or building the team mm -hmm. to make this puppet. But they didn't really have a lot of knowledge about how to do that. Right. So they brought me in to work and try to develop it into a puppet. I also am a sculptor, so I, I ended up um, sculpting on it. I sculpt really quickly. So they had a sculpt that they weren't quite happy with, so I started sculpting again and finally got to a head that they liked, and then Stuart refined at the end. Um, and I also did a practice puppet just out of snipped foam that everybody loved and mm. that they decided that was the character that they wow. wanted. And, and um, yeah, so when we, there were maybe four or five of us working together and one, two, three, four puppeteers working, three of us with Frank. We had no idea that this little green guy would become 
such an icon. So iconic. We yeah. really had no idea. Do you get tired of being asked about it? I always <laughs> wonder with artists, you know, who continue to have a line of work, yeah. you know what I mean? And so yeah. you guys continue to make relevant work. Uh, to this day and then someone wants it's like, again it's like being the stones and people want to hear jumping jack flash and you go well we got this new record and people go ah who gives a shit about that <laughs> right play the oldies and so does it do you are you do you walk around feeling satisfied at having put that into the world or do you just go yeah yeah yoda enough no, already I'm, <laughs> I'm really proud to have been a part of it i really am yeah uh, i'm proud proud to be called the mother of yoda <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would be too <laughs> Um, no. So it's, it's a pleasure to mm. talk about it with people, especially because I like that Yoda best. Yeah, I do too. I was just going to say, you know, I mean, Chuck Klosterman talks about, you know, uh, the music he listened to when he was a teenager and he says, you know, he, when he was 16, he, his favorite band was Motley Crue, right? And he <laughs> says now, um, you know, he, he full well understands that Radiohead is a better band than Motley Crue. He understands by every measure that Tom York is a genius and Vince Neil is not. He says, but I don't like Radiohead as much as I like Motley Crue mm -hmm. because I'm not 15 anymore, right? And and I liked everything more when I was 15. And so, you know, using that as a lens, I think back to my viewing of the Star Wars films and I think I like your Yoda better. And then I asked myself, is that because I was, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12 years old when that came out or was that really because there's something different? And I think when I watched the new films, um, the, well, the previous new films before right. I hear JJ is actually returning to, to actual artists yep. and actual, which is, which will be interesting to see. Um, but when I saw the CG Yoda, I had no empathetic connection to the character whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I just, it was a, a, a bit of computer rendering and I still have yet to be able to empathize with a computer rendered character. I don't know why that is, but I just, it's very difficult for me. I mean, I mean, maybe if the entire, I mean, Toy Story or something, if the entire world is rendered, yeah. but inserting a CG character into a film with actors, it just, it, there's something that was lost there. There's something about the physicality of Yoda. I think so. I think people... The expression, it just, you yes. know, when he's disappointed in Skywalker <laughs> yes, for not being can. able to lift the TIE fighter or for his anger outburst, you, the, the look in his face, I mean, I can still see it now, you know, <laughs> you kind of feel that disappointment. I think it's because he is a physical character mm -hmm. and people want to believe they really do. But I think for the most part, so many of us feel vaguely disappointed when we see CG characters and we don't really know why mm -hmm. we feel like we should believe we want to believe, yeah. but we just can't. Yeah. But with a puppet, it has gravity. It's there. You know, it's there in some mm. form or another. So you can believe in it. The thing I think about Yoda is, um, because we were doing, an, an, a, and a pun is intended, I suppose, a dummy run for Dark Crystal, because we were exploring with Yoda about the possibilities of making people believe in a puppet. Mm. Um, but the way Yoda was created with using, um, you know, a, a practice puppet uh, really added to the character mm. because... Frank was going to puppeteer, and in those days, you know, the Muppets were done with arm wires, and so the Jimmy often used to get desperate to try to hide arm wires. And so, um, and in fact, a lot of the designs I did in Dark Crystal were how to hide arm uh, wires. Arm wire. so, but Frank said, well, if, you don't, if you're not hiding arm wires, if you give him a stick, that's the, the arm king. wire. Yeah. We just make it visible. And so um, from that, uh, Frank developed the walk, hmm. you know, because the other thing is he's not, hmm. you know, you don't, you don't see, I mean, you do see him in certain situations, you see his feet and that, but when he's walking around, this is Frank underneath and you, and Wendy was doing the ears. But hmm. so that the whole character comes from limitations and all the puppets I designed were all about limitations because puppets do hardly anything. But yeah. the CG one just bounces but, off the yeah. walls. Yeah, it think, jumps around like a ninja. Do that. but that's yeah. where that's that's the big mistake. Yeah. To throw away your the previous characterizations that that Yoda had all this wonderful power through him being a, this little wizard thing. Old man, and really yeah. not doing much of anything. Yeah. And just uh, because you can do something doesn't mean you should. No, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well and said. and I, I know that, um, you know, I've been to showings of Dark Crystal with students and they come out and they ask, well, what was, what was that? 
I said, I don't know what you mean. I said, what were we looking at? <laughs> and I said, I still don't know what you mean. They said, but it looks different. And they don't realise it's puppets. And I go, oh. it's puppets, it's real. I said, What's, what you're seeing is real. It's not CGI. And that... And, and it's real time as well. Yeah. So with the puppets, Good it's, a, it's a, um, a collections of mistakes, collections of things that don't quite work with a human being behind it somehow through the hand mm -hmm. with with but their psyche is somehow connected to this uh, uh, this mixture of physicalities mixtures of you know cloth and because it's things. the way people work as well yeah. you know so we people are inherently we recognize that mm. i think when we see it so we relate to it yeah I, uh, producer Mike, uh, recommended a documentary film for me to watch recently called I Dream of Wires, and it's about, um, uh, modular synthesizers and the kind of development of them over the years from the late 50s and 60s into the kind of great digital synth boom, um, to when the thing collapsed and then how it's had this resurgence. And one of the things I found fascinating about the film, and I made a connection maybe because I've been thinking about all things Froud for the past several <laughs> days, but, um... I made a connection to your work because what what's really interesting about these things is um, the the digitize the digital revolution in music changed the need for all of these analog components, right? So these these massive systems with wires and knobs and things that these these composers would get these sounds out of now can be done on a laptop with a couple of simple programs. Um, and so you don't need all of that stuff anymore, right? But what they found is a couple of things. They found that you can't quite get the same sound, the same warm tones out of the digital stuff as you can out of the analog. But more importantly, even if they can approximate the sounds, they found that the artists don't have as much fun Mm. with the computer programs as they do with the old machines because and they talk to these artists and they say it's hard to feel inspired when you're just creating on a laptop but when you have this thing and it has all of these limitations and what and there's a short and this thing here and this tube is out and whatever I, I have to work in real time with this device in order to collectively produce this piece of art and it's so much more raw it's so much more real and it's and it's more tangible. They want to have their hands on something. And I thought about your art and how it, it maintains that. It maintains this kind of visceral connection to to the real. Thank right? you. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, limitations are really important, it seems to me, because that's out of that comes, I think, a really focused creativity. Um, um, and I find that when I'm painting pictures, is that. Um, they are, as I get older, they become looser and looser. Mm. Um, and I'm always astonished when you look at uh, other artists' work. Sometimes I think they're often over-rendered. And I think this is the problem with digital work in, in films. It's over-rendered. And, and so with my art, I'm very careful to allow um, the eye to... Uh, have access to it that you can step into the picture that you the uh, that the rendering is doesn't um skid you off that it allows you in because so, it's some of it's not quite finished it's and it's open so the energy of the painting is always open to the viewer that you become part of it and I think that's what the you know what we're talking about in the in the, in the puppetry that does that. I think with CGI, it doesn't do that. Hmm. So we're back to liminal. Spaces we're back again. to the we're edges to of everything. Yeah. Where about, we started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's not quite seen. Yeah. We are almost out of time. Just a couple of quick questions for you. What's what's next? What's on the horizon for the both of you? What projects are you working on? Is is this Dark Crystal 2 ever going to materialize? <laughs> <laughs> I have you can tell no, by our laughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you're not going to break have, the no, news no. here, are you? No. <laughs> I mean, I've indeed, over the years, I've done some work on the possibility. I've done some designs, but um, it's not in my hands whether that ever gets The books, made. Uh, there's the Fairy Tales book. The Trolls book uh, is doing really well, and it's beautiful as well. Thank Thank you. Traveling in uh, ex uh, exhibitions. Uh, what else do you guys yeah. have going on? Well, we're working on uh, a new Coddington book, which is mm. part of the Pressed Fairy series, yeah. bringing it up to date with a new member of the Coddington family. It's a young American girl who goes to discover her Coddington roots. Oh, excellent. A <laughs> Coddington series is another really wonderful series. That, it's uh, really fun. I'm doing their writing for this one, and I'm enjoying it greatly. 
I wanted to, to close by reading a section of a, a Joseph Campbell quote from A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, again, it just, uh, so much of Campbell's work, you know, and I know Lucas was really influenced by him. I don't know if Jim had much influence from Joseph Campbell, but so much of your work, yeah. Yeah. when I when I sit with it and consider it, when we went to the gallery here recently, what was the name of this, uh, uh, that gallery? The gallery is called the Fernie Bray. The Fernie Bray. It's on uh, uh, Southeast Hawthorne That's and right. 41st Avenue here in Portland. So make sure you go check that out, folks. Um, your work is currently on display there and will be there. We will always have work in that gallery. We'll always have work yes. in that gallery. So yes, we people are, always we are have a reason to go down. Very connected with the gallery. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, the Campbell quote goes as follows. The agony of breaking through personal limitations is the agony of spiritual growth. Art, literature, myth, and cult, philosophy, and aesthetic principles are instruments to help the individual past his limiting horizons into spheres of ever-expanding realization. As he crosses threshold after threshold, conquering dragon after dragon, the stature of the divinity that he summons to his highest wish increases until it subsumes the cosmos. Finally, the mind breaks the bounding sphere of the cosmos to a realization transcending all experiences of form, all symbolizations, all divinities, a realization of the infinite void. Um, Brian and Wendy Froud, I, I really think your work, as, as visceral and as tactile and as immediate as it is, at least to me, speaks to this. I, it helps me see right past the representation to this kind of birthplace of creation that exists behind it. So I, I just want to thank you both for, for the inspiration you share with the world and for the kind of beauty, the lasting beauty of your art. Well, thank well, you, thank very you very much. much. I would disagree with Joseph Campbell uh, about conquering dragons, and this is another <laughs> thing that I think I get from your work. I think if we make peace with our dragons, we get to hop up on their backs and ride them around. Yes, we do. And I think that's a much. I think that's what the message of the Dark Crystal is. The the evil people aren't destroyed; they're they're reintegrated back into the whole person. And so I think uh, dragon fighting is a waste of time. I think we reconcile ourselves to our dragons, and then. We find much more power and creativity in there. And that's another thing I think I've learned from your art. Yeah. Kiss that dragon. <laughs> Kiss that dragon, indeed. <laughs> uh, before we go, is there anything you'd like to add, either of you? I think we've said it all. Uh, we've said it all, yeah. haven't we? <laughs> You've been listening to On the Block Radio with Andy Gervich. My gracious guests have been Brian and Wendy Froud. Wendy, you said you were receiving an award today. Let's end with that. What is that about now? Oh, it's the Portland Film Festival. It's it's wonderful. It's it's a lifetime achievement award for being a woman in the film industry, and I suppose really for being the mother of Yoda. Wow, fantastic! <laughs> and congratulations. That's well deserved. Thank you very much. Um, the industry is traditionally uh, harsh and unkind towards women, and there aren't nearly as many roles for creative and mm. powerful women as there should be, both in front of and behind the camera. So I feel very you. privileged to have been a part of that. And thank you for being a trendsetter with that. Thank and, you. <laughs> You're listening to On the Block with Andy Gervich. Uh, tune in again next time for another wonderful episode with our guests. Again, thank you to Brian and Wendy Froud for being here. See you down the road. You've been listening to On the Block with Andrew Gervich. The show is produced in Portland, Oregon by Michael DiNapoli at MD Productions. Theme music by Cat Power. Closing music by Jonathan Oak. Look us up on the web at ontheblockradio.com, where you can also link to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode. Previous episodes can be found on our website. Thanks for listening. Oh, you beautiful kitty kitties. Oh, look at you out there. Creators of art, history, thought. with you what cannot be done. Hear you nothing that I say. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try.